There's obviously a lot of great stories in the Gospel, but my favorite story in the entire Gospel comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary, and find light burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek and humble of heart, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the reason I love that particular passage is because it's immensely practical. It gives us very practical and concrete and specific advice as to what to do when we're feeling kind of stressed and even kind of overwhelmed. So right off the hop, the Lord says, come, just come. You're feeling stressed, you're feeling overwhelmed, even a little bit, just come. Don't be shy, don't be bashful, don't be reluctant. Don't go the way of traditional coping strategies like avoidance or distraction. Just come. Come for grace to navigate through a difficult situation, but primarily come for wisdom, come for truth, inspiration. Lord, here's my experience. Here's how I'm looking at it. Here's what I'm feeling. Am I missing something? Can you give me a new perspective? Is there a different way to look at this thing? Or should I just change my whole approach even? In this, you're meant to see this recurring dynamic you often find in the context of a spiritual life. This curious and almost playful interplay between gift and task. So when it comes to any sort of grace in the context of the world, certainly it's a gift. Freely given, freely received, and never earned, never merited. At the same time, typically, the gift comes with a task. There's something I need to do to unlock the lock or to unwrap the gift. And the context of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, it's pretty specific. So the gift is my peace, my freedom, my rest. The task, though, is threefold. Take my yoke upon you and imitate my meekness and my humility. So just to kind of work through these things one at a time, right? So first of all, this notion of yoke. I think we covered this before, but just to make sure we're on the same page. So a yoke has two parts. There's like the harness around the neck, and there's this thing called the haltery, which is the bar at the back. And it's typically carried by two animals. There could be more, but there's always two. An experienced animal and a less experienced animal. And the whole idea is that the only way that the yoke is easy and the burden is light, the less experienced animal has to follow the lead of the more experienced animal, following pace and rhythm and that type of thing. If he goes too fast, the yoke chokes him out. If he goes too slow, that bar hits him in the back of the legs, and that hurts too. Right? So it goes with our relationship with Christ. Eyes on Christ, not on ourselves. Eyes on Christ, not on the world not in our problem. Doing everything according to the Lord's will. Rhythm, pace, shared goal, shared mission. Only in that do you experience the yoke being easy and the burden being light. Second thing, this notion of meekness. So oftentimes what you hear in the context of the gospel is gentleness. Learn from your friend, gentle of heart. I find that kind of misleading because it kind of implies that meekness means being shy. But in reality, meekness is not simply being gentle. It's not about being shy. It has nothing to do with social dexterity. It has everything to do with focus and discipline. So think about, for example, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Augustine. Pre-conversion, what were these guys like? Full of power, full of strength, full of vigor, but all over the place. St. Peter cutting off that servant's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane on Holy Thursday. Pretty graphic, pretty violent. Think about St. Paul roaming about the countryside, persecuting and killing Christians. Or St. Augustine, pre-conversion, caught up in sexual sin. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Post-conversion, what were they like? All their strength, all their power, but now there's focus. Now there's discipline. Now they can serve God's particular purposes for their lives. And therein lies the key to interpreting meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength with focus, power with discipline. Third thing, humility. I think a lot of times when we think about humility, we think it's about being dishonest. Oh, I'm not that smart. Unless you really aren't that smart, in this case you're actually being honest. <laughs> but humility is not about being dishonest. It's not about denying your gifts and talents. Humility is about being fully present to your actual life as opposed to living in your head. When you painfully watch yourself live life as you're living life, that's when you start to get nervous and afraid. That's where you encounter fear and ego and pride, right? So to illustrate the point, I always think about elite athletes. So think, for example, if you're a professional basketball player, you're playing a really high-stakes playoff game. Like, what are you thinking when you're playing that game? You're probably not thinking, boy, I hope you don't miss a shot. 
But on the other hand, you're not thinking, I'm totally going to make this shot because I'm awesome. <laughs> you're not thinking at all. Because you're lost in the great rhythm and beauty of the game. And so it goes with us. I trust in the Lord, I trust in myself, and so I can just live my life. Now, a lot going on there, but an easy way to kind of summarize all these things we're talking about is to think of it in terms of a checklist. You're going about your life, you're starting to feel stressed, you're starting to feel overwhelmed, even a little bit. First of all, to ask yourself, do we have this habit of prayer where I take captive my thoughts? So I have this thought, I have this particular thought pattern. Is this from the Lord or is it not? If it's from the Lord, by all means, savor that particular thought or thought pattern. Taste and see the Lord is good. Keep and ponder in imitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But if it's not, firmly reject that particular thought or that particular thought pattern. Second thing, focus on the few things the Lord wants you to do carefully and well. Situate everything in God's call. To have this firm resolution in your heart, I'm not going to waste any time or even spend the slightest amount of energy doing something the Lord is not calling me to do. I will only do the things that the Lord is calling me to do, quite apart from the things that I could do, quite apart from the things the world says that I should do. And the third thing, you want to make sure you have good process. Everything I do is supposed to be with the Lord and for the Lord. It's not live in my head, it's not painfully watch myself live life, not too fast, not too slow, doing everything with the Lord and for the Lord. Focusing on the duty of the moment, focusing on the duty of love, allowing myself to get lost in the great rhythm and beauty of my actual life. Okay, a couple of examples just to kind of flesh this out. So recently I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, Restore the Glory, with Dr. Bob Schutz and Jay Kim. And Dr. Bob was sharing a story involving his late wife, Margie. And so basically what he said was that back in the day, he was having an argument with his wife. And in the aftermath of this argument, he felt kind of bitter and defensive. But fortunately, he took the thing to prayer. Lord, here's my experience. I'm kind of upset, I'm kind of stressed out, but I want to take captive my thoughts. How do you see the situation? And just to paraphrase what the Lord said to him was like, look, your wife is not your enemy. <laughs> your wife is not rejecting you. That's how you're interpreting it. She's saying these things, which are critical. And so you're thinking, well, gosh, she's rejecting me. She's not. She's actually pointing out certain things that you're doing or not doing, which constitute barriers to you receiving my grace, barriers to you becoming your true self. And all of a sudden, the whole thing broke open. Now I see my wife as, as a gift, as a blessing, sent to me by the Lord to help me become the person that he's calling me to be and the person that I want to be. Same situation, different perspective, peace obtains. One final example, and with this. So as you know, we just finished our summer camp, Totus to Us, and my favorite part of the Totus to Us program is the apologetics night that we have with our older kids. So we had that day camp for grades one to six, and we had the evening camp for grades seven to 12. And one night, again, is an apologetics night. And so basically it's a night where we take questions from the kids. Some of the questions are anonymous, so they're written questions, but we also give them the option to ask questions from the floor. And so we had this panel of speakers. So obviously there were the four missionaries from the Archdiocese of Toronto, some of from staff, and then obviously myself. For most of the questions, to be honest, I was referring to, to the group, because a lot of the questions had to do with doctrine. What does the church teach about this, that, and the other thing? So I was like, no, you know what, you can take that. You can take that question, you can take that question. I was saying that over and over again. Then finally, one question came from the floor, which was really interesting. So it was on the heart of this young woman who is amazing and has this really beautiful heart. And I'm not gonna do justice to it, but basically what she said was this. Let's say you're trying your best, but you find yourself going to confession and you're confessing the same thing over and over again. Does that mean that you're closer to God or the devil? Now, just the way that question is phrased, you can tell, okay, this is not an abstraction. This is very concrete and intensely personal. So I turned to the panel, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna take this one. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, here's the deal. There's different ways people approach the sacrament of confession. And so some people, when they go to confession, you get the sense that they're talking around the margins, talking about things which are on the periphery. You get the sense they're not really addressing core issues 
particular ways that the Lord is actually calling them to new freedom and new life. And that could be for a whole variety of reasons. And if that's the case, fine. You're happy to journey with people where they're at. God of reality, right? On the other hand, there's other people where the vibe is like, I'm trying my best to go God's way. But it's hard. It's hard and it's painful to even look at those places in my heart where there's darkness, where there's a need for conversion, where the Lord has called me to freedom. Never mind actually apply myself to fight the good fight. And sometimes I feel like I'm making progress, but sometimes not. Actually, a lot of times not. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm succeeding. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm failing and failing massively. And this is one of those days. So now I'm here and I, I need God's forgiveness. I'm asking for his mercy because I don't want to settle and I want to be free and I love Jesus Christ. People might not use those exact words, but that's the vibe that comes across. And if the question is, what do I think of these people? You bless me with your presence. And I'm inspired by your example. I can't tell you how oftentimes that happens and I'm like, gosh, I gotta be, I gotta be more honest. I gotta try harder. And I have to be more generous with the Lord, like you. And it's my great privilege to be with people in that space, to absolve them from their sins, to relieve them of the burden, and to invite them and command them to go in the peace of Christ. A lot of times when we think about the idea of coming to the Lord in our weariness, it's often kind of scary. We think to ourselves, oh gosh, if I come to the Lord in fear and trembling and he responds with indifference or harshness or some variation of like, just suck it up, something in my heart will die. <laughs> and so I don't come because the idea of coming to God is scary. The Lord invites us to overcome that. Yeah, there's a part of your heart that's reluctant to come, but please come. And when you do, you experience in retrospect, my goodness, the Lord actually is the Good Shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. And he alone has the yoke which is easy and the burden which is light.